Hello, and welcome to the Virtual Horasis India meeting. My name is Jaydeep Sen. I'm a South and Southeast Asia analyst at the political risk firm Oxford Analytica and the chair for this digital breakfast session on India's investment policy. So in this session, a key issue for us to consider is going to be what sort of constraints India faces in its attempts to attract much needed FDI. In this regard, I expect we will talk about issues such as land acquisition and tax liability. Besides discussing the regulatory environment for inward foreign investment, we might attempt to determine which sectors in India are best placed to draw FDI at this time. We should also think about the possible impact on FDI inflows of concerns about underlying social tensions. Are these concerns peripheral to prospective investors or do they substantively impact decisions about doing business in India? So joining me on the panel to explore such matters are five leading entrepreneurs. Hindal Sen Gupta, Vice President of Invest India. Alan Rosling, Chairman of EQ Investment Advisors. Viren Joshi, CEO of Sigma Electric Manufacturing Corporation. Moon Jia, founder of Doctrina. And Claude Begley, President of Symbiosis. Although Claude has not joined us yet, maybe he'll come in at some point. We aim to have as free an exchange as possible. Hopefully there can be some lively disagreement as well as agreement on certain points. Do also remember that you, the audience, are welcome to submit questions and comments through the conference platform. So before we proceed to the main discussion, I would like to invite the panelists each to take just one minute, literally one minute, and I'll have to be strict, to set out one key thought relating to our topic of discussion. And then I'll pick one of them to get the ball rolling. So Hindul, maybe we can begin with you. Thank you, Jaydeep. Thank you very much and good morning to everybody, all my fellow speakers, to you, Jaydeep, and to everybody who's listening. The key thought that I want to put forward right in the beginning of this session is that there is a fundamental change occurring in India, which will touch every aspect of doing business with it, uh, including, of course, the aspect of foreign direct investment. And that fundamental change is that led by Prime Minister Narendra Modi, India is transforming into a digital first country. And India's uniqueness in transforming into a digital first country is that it, its digital platform and its network and its structures will not be owned by, unlike in some other countries, one or two big companies. And indeed, it will not be dominated and owned by the state. India is not transforming unlike some other countries into a surveillance state, but in the best possible democratic manner, India is transforming into a digital first country where the use of digital technology percolates into the grassroots. Many of you would already know about India's endeavors in this field, but bear with me as I you know, repeat a couple of them. Of course, some of you would know India's endeavors in building a transaction, digital transaction system which now really uh, facilitates billions of transactions every month and is going deeper with each passing day. Of course, this has been enabled by India's um, Aadhaar system, which is its identification system, and of course, its um, system of uh, ensuring that almost every other Indian now owns a mobile smartphone. And this is now spreading. The power of this system is now spreading into other lucrative, should I say, sectors like digital health, digital education, and other delivery mechanisms. I would like to point uh, your attention to India's recent decision to unshackle its agriculture sector by removing some of the barriers of the Essential Commodities Act, which really means for the first time Indian agriculture is poised to see a revolution, uh, especially in models that have to do with the farm to fork mechanism. And all of this will be powered by a digital network, a digital infrastructure, uh, where the state plays an enabling role, the state plays an equalizing role. Um, all of you would know that it is an Indian platform uh, led by one of the biggest companies in India that has, even during this pandemic, raised billions of dollars from a plethora of uh, investors from around the world. And what is the value proposition? I would um, request you to pause for a moment and think of this, you know, this, this raising of money, so to speak. Well, it is indeed the power of this, this massive audience empowered by digital technology. 
Uh, I think that is perhaps a moot point, a structural issue, more than like, you know, whether this taxation is a little higher or lower and so on and so forth, some of which might be temporary. We should perhaps discuss the structural transformation. Absolutely. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, Alan, how about you? Sure. Um, good, good morning, everybody. Um, just to disagree with something Hindle says, I'm a bit worried that we are actually having a monopoly. Uh, he mentioned the geo platform. It's looking awfully powerful to me. So I hope the Competition Authority of India is taking a look at it. Um, the, my, my suggestion that what's something we should focus on is the historic opportunity India faces today to seriously attract FDI in a way which it has never done before, and particularly to do so around manufacturing. I think that we've had a series of things going on, which means that China will almost certainly lose market share of global manufacturing. Um, it's around costs, which has been rising in China for many years. Then, of course, Mr. Trump's trade wars have rattled the supply chains. And most recently, of course, the virus has meant that people have really looked at more secure and more diverse and more robust supply chains. India is the logical place to me for, to put global supply uh, because of the size of the market, because of the cost advantages, because of the competitiveness of Indian industry and management and technology. The problem, of course, lies in the cost disadvantages that the government has placed on manufacturing businesses, and it is not around FDI policy. The FDI policy is now until recently, almost exclusively open. Only a few laggards remain, like retail policy, which is crazy, insurance, which is embedded in the 99 Act. But other than that, almost every sector is open. So the reason that FDI is not coming to India to the extent it should lies in areas other than FDI policy itself. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Viren, let's move on to you. Thank you. Good morning. Good evening, everybody. Well, a topic I wanted to focus on again was India as a manufacturing base. And Alan's practically covered all my points. So thank you, Alan, for that. Appreciate it. Again, just taking it further, I truly believe because of what I've seen and experienced, the deep manufacturing ex equities that we have in India and the ability to use that. And as Alan rightly said, recent events make it all the more forceful point that India could become that supply chain base for the world. The world is looking for alternate supply chains to, to take care of risk mitigation. And India is well positioned. Now, the question for all of us is, is India willing to take that challenge? Does India have the courage to take that challenge? We, everybody talks about it. In all fairness, all of us know the government reaches out to everybody in the industry. All of us have been contacted at some time or the other. So every question Every answer that needs to be known is a, is a way the government is aware of. Everything is known to them. It's a question of how do they react, how do they act, and how quickly can they do that. And I'm just going to list a few very, very quickly, which is going to be important in today's world that India needs to follow, follow through quickly. I think they need to quickly sign up a free trade agreement with the U.S., with, with the European Union, and strengthen the FTA that they've signed with ASEAN, but not really implemented in the real spirit of it. That's the number one. We can get that done. And in today's environment, I might have said something different a month ago, but in today's environment and for the future, looking at what's happened with China being fairly aggressive with all its neighbors, I would say India strategically should not sign for the RCEP. That it should stay away from that strategically as, as a, from a security point of view and strategically stay away from it. Secondly, focus on, I think there should be some protectivism. First time I'm ever saying this, but I think for India, for India's industry to grow, especially on handicrafts, small scale industry, and a wide variety of products which are coming in. And this, today, at least I'm focusing on China, put in a tariff barrier just for a couple of years and make sure the SMEs and the, and the mid-sized industries grow. There's a, there's a trade difference of nearly about 30, 40 billion dollars. If 10 to 20 billion dollars of that can be converted into import substitution and brought into India, that can strengthen India's manufacturing base. Then, as Alan rightly said, we need to make India more competitive. I've spent a lot of time focusing with the government, trying to do that, trying to focus with Niti Aayog to do that. And I've got some traction with them. There was a lot of recept receptivity from the government to, to go ahead. 
and we've gone to a certain stage of putting together a, a lean India cro- across India, several thousand organizations to be part of it. That cost competitiveness is something that we need to bring in to India, into India right away through the industry. I'll stop there. There are a couple of other points, but I'm hoping I can bring that up during the discussion. Absolutely. We will come back to some of these points. Thank you. And lastly, but not least, uh, Moon. Thank you. Uh, good morning and good evening to everyone. Um, thank you, everyone, for bringing up some really interesting points. I'll just add to whatever you guys said. I think for the the FDI to come to India, I guess I would have made a very different comment you know, just a few months ago. But in the last three months or almost like six months, there has been a huge, not only a geopolitical change in India and worldwide, given the China and the American political situation and the coronavirus, I think a lot of things are going to be different, whether or not we're going to like it. But what I think, um, in addition to the manufacturing industry, what India is a really good player for is the pharmaceutical industry. Even the fact that the type of research that the Indian scientists are doing at the moment, you know, um, developing some of the vaccination, the type of research that they're doing, I think that's a fantastic area. Number two, I would say a lot of different types of investment in the next level of exploration. Given what SpaceX just did, you know, Elon Musk, I think, India is one of those countries, it's kind of downplayed in terms of how much more advancement that they can make. So I think a lot of the um, investors can definitely make sure to explore that in India. And number three, I do see currently, um, I do know one of the companies that is still raising, they have raised a substantial, substantial amount of money in the last six months into the satellite industry, uh, creating the satellite and the technologies coming from the U.S., and using it from their, you know, um, fishing industry purposes. So there are some of these niche areas, but given the population and the size of India and the neighboring countries that they have, I think there is huge opportunities for the FBIs to come to India. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So lots of interesting ideas that to, to go on. I wonder if we could begin um, roughly where we started uh, with this uh, issue about the, the digital economy that uh, Hindal raised. And then uh, Alan came back and, and suggested that, well, maybe he has certain concerns about, uh, you know, monopolies. Could you two maybe develop this uh, this argument somewhat? Either one of you can begin. Alan. No. Yeah, Alan can begin. Okay, no, um, I think what Hindal said is, is exactly right. India is a fantastic place for digital businesses. And in a way, because of the, the weaknesses of the infrastructure and the complexity of the real economy, one is forced to find digital solutions in ways that you don't need to in China, for example, where, um, you know, transaction costs are much less. Um, however, um, oh, and the other thing I should say is India is the only place where US tech and China tech bump into each other, which is great for the Indian consumer because you've got, you know, Alibaba playing Amazon in a way which the, it doesn't happen anywhere else in the world. Um, we've got the world's best um, uh, fintech solutions coming out of China and, uh, you know, AI being brought in from China um, and equally thinking about, um, uh, uh, did, you know, retail uh, e-commerce coming in from the U.S. Um, what worries me simply is, is you know, I was triggered by the, by the comment about Geo because um, it's clear that, um, Geo is cementing itself as a very, in a very powerful position with some very um, significant resources. It's a very significant partners, uh, Facebook, etc. Um, and inevitably, there is a risk that we move towards a, a two dominant position, which I guess is what's happened in the US. People are concerned about Amazon or Facebook, and in China, clearly Alibaba um, and Tencent are incredibly powerful even though they might be um, kept under control by the state. Um, so I just what you know, the thing which India needs is a pro-consumer, uh, very active competition policy to, uh, to police this for the benefit of Indian consumers, not for the benefit of Indian producers. Okay. Indor. I think uh, before I comment on what Alan just said, um, I must say that this is this is I'm most pleased this morning that for the first time in one of these sessions I've heard somebody understand that there is a need for a little bit of import substitution, especially for our vast MSME sector. And I must thank uh, this this point for being raised uh, because 
you know, usually this point is not understood, and I'm most pleased that this is. Um, please understand that uh, on the MSME point, India needs to build its MSMEs if it will ever have the kind of manufacturing that everybody, including all Indians, want it to have. And that in must happen or that will happen only if certain barriers go up, uh, even if it's for a certain amount of time, so that India's strength in MSMEs is really built up. To take Alan's point, I'm of the firm belief that monopolies have never really worked very well in India um, in many sectors. And I'm of the firm belief that even if there seems to be monopolies uh, building up, at least to Alan, uh, there would be other partners seeping in. And there are many conversations, which I'm sure he's aware of, with other competi uh, competing companies that are already happening, which will have an impact in the market. Now, this is not the platform for me to go into details. Uh, I'm sure many of you already know details of those conversations and which partners are having conversations with other US companies or other companies. But, uh, but I'm of the opinion that the market would be far more diversified and hopefully, uh, even in the midterm, we will see that some of um, Alan's fears will not actually come true. Okay. Um, where does India's data protection policy fit into all of this? I think it's work in progress. Uh, and many things indeed are work in progress. Please remember, we are talking about, I think it's often forgotten that what is India doing? What India is doing is, in a sense, a mini miracle. It is bringing the power of data to the grassroots in a manner and to people who may not even have had what you and I would understand as basic education. And yet to empower them with the power of data, with the power of a smartphone, to enable it in languages and manners, shapes and forms that actually bring value to their lives. Now, this is a, is a process. And it's not going to be done in one day, but it is a process that, that we are actively working on. Uh, and, uh, you know, in the, the data protection conversation, as you know, in, and I want to just point out what happened in the Arogya Setu case, right? That there were certain concerns that were raised and they were immediately addressed. So this conversation, it's a dialogue. And this dialogue is continuing, I would argue, rather fruitfully. But there has to be it's a process. It will not get done overnight. And there will be challenges that will emerge. But as challenges emerge, we are seeing, as we saw in the Arugya Seto case, there is a receptive sort of year which is responding to those concerns. So I think that needs to be appreciated. Okay. And um, I mean, Alan, you were mentioning Geo. And I suppose this is a more general point. It is not just about uh, the digital economy, but is it fair to say that uh, the Prime Minister's vision for um, India's economic development is that really large Indian corporations should lead the way? And in a sense, uh, you know, foreign investors, of course, uh, are, are much needed, but they play a sort of ancillary role. Is that a fair characterization, would you say? And more generally, I mean, how would you explain the reliance phenomenon? That's addressed to me? Yeah, or anybody. Okay, well, as an ex-Tata guy, I've got to be careful with comment on reliance, but... Um, I mean, I, I think I mean, what I'm slightly worried, I have to say, with this um, self-reliance, which has crept into the rhetoric in the last few months. Uh, of course, I understand, um, you know, the, the, the knee jerk to say we need to protect our small businesses and we need national champions and all this sort of thing. It's very easy to, to say. Um, the reality is India the, is the most competitive place in the world and we should be self-confident. Um, you know, Virumbhai talked about the sheer competitiveness of Indian manufacturing and Hindal talked about the service sector and the, what's going on in data. India is an extraordinary place where you can build world-beating companies. So rather than spending our time protecting, you know, going back to policies of the past, you know, we don't want the ambassador back and we certainly don't want, you know, reserved sectors for small companies and, and so on. Um, what the government, I would hope, is doing is focusing on making India as open and as competitive as it can. I mean, for instance, in manufacturing, because you can't transform the whole of Bharat in one, one go, even in a 10-year term or 15-year term for Mr. Modi, um, why don't we just learn from the Chinese and create world-class SEZs close to a port, you know, take a 100 acres near Chennai port and build a, a system there where international manufacturers 
can export uh, and they can import without all the hassles of Indian ports, you know, without the labor inspector calling them, um, you know, with secure power, etc. The reasons why India is not part of the global supply chain um, are things to do with the physical infrastructure and the way the bureaucracy works. Um, it's not to do with, with FDI policy, as I said earlier on. So um, I would just plead with, with the policymakers in Delhi not to be tempted back into the thinking of the 60s and 70s. It doesn't work, guys. We know that. Um, okay. Any I would to add to that a little bit. Um, and I would also go back to a, a point that um, uh, someone else made. It gets back to two things where... I am increasingly seeing this tendency of still keeping India, I think, protected. And I would say, you know, if I may disagree with you, that yes, from one point of view, you you might think that just by keeping India very protected, even for a certain time, that the SM is going to be very much um, benefited. But I disagree with that. And why? And these are all interlinked. And I don't think these are issues that we can always look at in a very separate way, such as data protection. What does data protection really mean? It means privacy, which is a huge thing all over the world. To some people from outside or even inside, they might think, well, a lot of Indian people don't care about it. But I guess we're really forgetting to take into account how is it going to really be affecting other tech and ICT companies' reputation who might become a global player from India. So it is something that we have to start considering, even though we may think that, you know what, it is something we're working on. Because... If we want, if you want to see India to be that most competitive person in the world, you know the champion, then you have to also take that seriously. So we can't just say no, it's okay, it's in the work in progress. Number two, in terms of um, just the SMEs, I definitely do believe, and I agree with Ellen that you know we don't, we don't, India doesn't have to play small about it. I think the way the SMEs can also transform is again like the way the Indian population were educated ten years ago, the way people had technology, the way people had have actually done businesses is no longer the same and the way it has been transforming we have to take that acceleration that change the rate of change how is it going to go and if we don't let other fdi to come in and don't create also that environment where the uh, international companies can actually flourish the bureaucracy in the country the fraudulent you know the difficulty of doing businesses they all have to come in places and i guess only then those rules will also transform the SMEs in India within itself and they will prepare them for the next generation of economy and just not going to be playing in a very local market. Indo, any follow-up on that? No, that? Just add to that, again, combining the focus on FDI, uh, growing the manufacturing base in India. I mean, a couple of things. I, I go back to my original concept again because I've had a lot of discussion at the government level on it, a lot of focus on lean and making India competitive. That will help on the manufacturing front. It will help on the SME front. And that's a big basic gap today. India might be large in manufacturing, have a lot of manufacturing capabilities, but our productivity is maybe one third, one fourth of what China is or many other good countries are. I think that's one ramp up. We might We might have low wages, but low wages multiplied by a lower productivity is not going to make us competitive. So that's one area which needs a lot of attention. It's understood but not being followed through in India. Another one I would believe in which can instantaneously result in a lot of FDI, a lot of manufacturing is, if you look at it, I'm a very I'm one of the largest manufacturers out of India. My plants manufacture a lot. But if I have a problem in export, who do I go to? There is not one central organization. I need a central department where for anything relating to exports, and I've talked to the government about this, they just put up one entity. I even jokingly told them, if you can't put it up anywhere else, put it under, under the PMO's office, for heaven's sake. We'll get instantaneous results. That's missing. If we can do that, we talk, there's a lot of talk about exports, but there's not a concentrated focal area where one, we can all go and, and take care of it. And a third one is, a, as a large manufacturer today, 50 at least 30% or 40% of the population is not available to me on the third shift. So I've gone again back to the government and said, why don't you allow ladies to work at night in the third shift? Yes, it's industry's job to protect them. Of course, we have to do that. So we'll do that. But why would you not allow that? You need to open up, allow women to work in the third shift, work all 24 hours. 
then it'll make you can see instantaneously there'll be a, a massive improvement in our in our labor availability in our productivity i mean I, I shouldn't say that but at least in my operations i can say, say it confidently the ladies in our operations were much more productive and much more efficient than the men so i don't mind saying that and and i and i think really could make a big difference so just a couple of these are a couple of focal points that we can do on the ground level can make a difference in india today to bring us part of that large global supply chain otherwise we're going to miss the boat again there's a big gap today the world is looking for it every across the world especially the us where all my customers are are looking for alternate supply chain opportunities right now okay thank you i mean i want to stick with this theme of of manufacturing and i also want to come back to um what moon was um talking about in relation to the pharma sector um moon maybe i could ask you i mean um i guess a key challenge for indian pharma at this juncture is to reduce reliance on china for apis for example um do you have any comments about this uh, i mean tell us more about this this particular sector um because if you see um uh, in last i think i think 5 to 10 years the way india was able to um put into their r&d and i think a lot of the time what happens is the media completely miss that mark to actually report the um the cost of production of the pharmaceutical industry in india is significantly lower than other countries and in my opinion i have seen that the trust factor when it comes down to medicine in pharmaceutical department it is actually more on indian pharmaceutical department than compared to china therefore only if india is able to i think and i would agree uh, with the, the previous comment that how can you create that central system where that supply chain is so well done that you know you're having that smooth relationship with the whole world and only then india has this huge opportunity to be able to monopolize the market not only in internationally but i think they have a huge opportunity in the southeast asian market as well but i don't if i may um, sure, just come in on this um and and not actually i don't think that the productivity which is the issue here is the is a government issue of course the government can do saying about skills and therefore when we recruit people out of college they should actually be able to you know do basic things but and not we don't have to retrain them which is what's happening at the moment but principally productivity is down to industry it's you know it's it's for us to to solve productivity within the boundaries of a factory and i would argue that in india within the boundaries of your factory typically you can have the world's most competitive manufacturing the only issue is we have a scale because the size of the market is not as large as china and we don't tend to export except in one or two sectors Um, like automotive you know small cars we're exporting so i really do think we should focus on the things which are holding us back for world scale world class manufacturing if you take one industry I, i've known something about in the last few years sitting on the board of a textile supply company why is it that bangladesh the ready made garment industry is twice or three times the size of india despite the disparities in size of the two economies um similar cost structures and india's historic strength in textiles um and the reason for that again to go back to previous points i made is that if you're part of a global supply chain in textiles you just cannot reliably import and export from india because of physical and governmental constraints um therefore you would prefer to go to bangladesh or vietnam rather than set up a, a plant employing 10000 people you know in some uh, sri city down down in the south or wherever you you may choose despite the competitiveness of indian labor and the quality of indian management So you know I I don't think that that looking to the government for a department of export promotion we we used to have that if you remember um and get incentives for it and everything else and that's not the key issue the government should do its job and we in industry should do our jobs if i can just add to what alan yeah. said i've always believed that i probably do agree with what alan says that in the end there are many things that we as industry need to take care of and we can't depend on the on the government for it it's really our job at the same time having gone through this for uh, quite a bit trying to promote lean trying to promote com- competitiveness among industries i did find that it was just getting difficult to become a make it a cohesive program and that's where i i at least change my opinion and said if the government like they put a program together for make in india and they had a program called z zero effect zero defect and it was just a program that then industry took over 
So that's what I did. I went back to back to the government and said, can we do something on Lean India? And then again, industry takes over. But the idea was like Make in India as a concept. If the government could put the weight behind the concept of of competitiveness and productivity, and then let industry run it, and that's what that's what the uh, the ministry agreed to. I thought that was a great way for a great partnership between the industry and the government, where the bulk of the effort really was with the industry. So on, on a Pareto, it's maybe ninety ten to get the maths wrong. It was really ninety percent of the in, industry doing it, but under the umbrella of of support. And again, involving the public sector where required. So it was just a, a whole collaboration, which I thought was really nice and, and worth bringing, uh, uh, bringing the ability to bring more competitiveness into the country. Um, uh, to add some point to Mr. Viren, a uh, really nice point. What I would still say, Alan, is that I get what you're saying. And I think what, where you're coming from, I think it really, really work in the Western world. But I think where exactly India is currently and the type of regulations and rules that is still exist to get out of there. My, our question should be here. How fast is it that we want to transform ourselves? Do you want to give yourself 10 years or do you want to get out of it in two to three years? In that case, you know, whenever you're talking about and manufacturing industry FDI in a large scale, you do need the help of government. There, there is no possible way to just for a private sector industry to go, go and do that. So and I think the best way to, as you said, I think it's a really what Viren said, you know, it has to be a cohesive process. The industries and the government has to be worked together for the betterment of the economy. Yeah, Moon, where I agree with you is that um, Invest India, we have uh, Hindal sitting quietly taking notes, I hope. Uh, The government has a role, obviously. The government should be out out marketing India as a fantastic place to manufacture and helping foreigners to come in to set up plants. I totally agree. The world's best inward investment agencies do this and can handheld, you know, land, um, you know, all the sort of things that, that people need. But all I'm saying is that India is a very sophisticated market. This is not, you know, some backwater in, in, you know, the boondocks. This is India, the world's most competitive businesses in many sectors. Um, but we have real constraints, which you can analyze. So the CII a few years ago did some comparisons in auto comp- components. Why is India not exporting auto comp? Despite the quality of engineering, the size of the local auto market, we were still less competitive than China, despite the labor costs, as Viren Bai was saying, being, you know, a, a third to a half of what Chinese labor costs are. Chinese are still more competitive and it comes down to productivity. So we need to address productivity and productivity comes within the fence, which industry needs to do something about. And that's around investment and scale and training people. But it's critically, as I keep saying, about all the the added costs, which which unfortunately the system in India, um, you know, it still takes three or four days for a truck to go from Madras to Calcutta. I mean, it's crazy compared to China, where it'd be you know, 24 hours to drive the same distance. Um, the, the port system, uh, the labor laws. Now, I understand the government is hacking away at these things, but my complaint about um, the government is it's not been radical enough. And we've got a crisis, guys. Let's use the crisis to do some really radical stuff. Yeah. Um, let's not just try to sell Air India. Let's close Air India and, you know, and, and, and move on, right? That sort of thinking where you go back to fundamentals and you say, what can we do to make India the world's best place to manufacture. Hindol, any response to that from the point of view of Invest India? So I think uh, two or three things. Um, sure. Uh, some of the points that have come up are points that have come up before. And to just to take the last point that Alan was making, uh, indeed, the India has hacked away, to use his words, at many of these things and is continuing to hack away at many of these things. Uh, I would like to point uh, to India's plans for a record amount of spend in infrastructure. We're going to really spend you know, billions of dollars of new infrastructure that is, that's going to be built. I would like to point towards uh, India's plans to build a whole new range of freight corridors. Uh, I would like to point towards ideas of whether it's railway, whether it's inland waterway, all of these things, um, as, as, as one of the co-panelists said, these things have been on the table and they are on the table. Uh, sometimes we are compared to countries that perhaps do things slightly faster than us. But uh, I think the world is cognizant now that uh, the countries that sometimes do things faster than us have other repercussions for the world. 
Um, but I think, uh, you know, we tend to do things well and tend to do things in our time. But we are cognizant of all of these things. And uh, I think uh, the Prime Minister's promise of Atmanirbhar, I think one of the co-panelists also mentioned this briefly, but Atmanirbhar does not, as the Prime Minister himself has suggested, does not in any way suggest that India is becoming inward looking at all. Atmanirbhar only suggests self-reliance. And in a post-COVID world, surely everybody in the world can understand the value of self-reliance. And self-reliance doesn't mean we do not engage with the world. Self-reliance does not mean we do not welcome the world. Self-reliance only means that we boost some of our own capacities to, uh, you know, bridge some of the, you know, vast and uh, deficits that we have may have built up with certain countries and so on and so forth. And um, as Alan said, um, indeed, I am uh, quietly jotting down notes uh, as, as, you know, uh, people like we do in panels like this. Um, and, and we are changing. We are changing dramatically. And uh, um, I certainly am hopeful that more change in, in these sectors. All, all the meetings, gentlemen and lady, uh, may I just say that all the concerns that have been brought up in this panel are actively being discussed uh, at the highest level. And, you know, and many of you might know more about this than I do. But, um, you know, they are being actively concerned. Uh, they are actively being considered. And I do hope that some of your concerns would be resolved sooner rather than later. I think in India, uh, under Prime Minister Modi, everybody is very cognizant of the opportunity that this crisis has brought. I'm just checking that comment, if I, if you may. Sure. Uh, I've, I've had the same experience that, uh, as I said that in the beginning also, every fa everything that we've discussed and more is known to the government because they've asked the question, they've got the answers, they've debated it. And the individual people that I've spent time with are very intelligent. They understand what needs to be done. Now it's a question of scale. It's a question of so many other factors and priorities. But I've been, I also have been pretty impressed with the amount of effort put into infrastructure. And very often when I sit, go across in different panels, the number one complaint I hear is give us better infrastructure. So my response, a little naughty, has always been I export thousands of containers out of India. And I can assure you, not one container has gone late, has gone delayed into the U.S. to all the largest customers, all my largest customers in the U.S. And I'm single source very often. Not one container, one component has gone late because of infrastructure. That doesn't mean I don't want better infrastructure. But I'm just saying the infrastructure in place today is sufficient to manage very large exports which are taking place from out, out of India. Should it get better? Absolutely. Can we do much more? We should. But, I, but again, as we've all said, there's a lot of focus needed on improving SMEs, productivity, a lot of things on the ground level, skilling. A lot more needs to be done on that, a lot more focus on automation, digitalization. All of that's happening today. But I think a lot of it's happening in the larger organizations, and it needs to translate down to the, to the small to medium scale industries. And they need to all work cohesively together as partners, large scale and the small scale industry. That's when there'll be a difference. And if I may just add... If that can be combined with a partnership with the educational institutions, especially the, the engineering institutions, that can that again can form a big make a big difference. It's very prevalent in the West. It's not so prevalent in India. And if that can be made as a huge opportunity again to combine industry and academia, make a big difference. So I just want to pick up on a question from the audience. Uh, I mean, it seems that, uh, you know, the, the thrust of what we've been saying is that the issue isn't necessarily to do with policy. It's more about a question of enablement. But we do have a question here. What policies do you think are needed in the construction industry? So maybe somebody could uh, could address that. Well, I, I don't think it's so much to do with FDI, of course, the construction industry. I mean, I think the biggest issue in the construction industry in India is health and safety, in my personal view. Uh, it's a very, very competitive industry. The, the quality of some of the um, contractors, the EPC guys and the subcontractors are, is world class. So there's no issue. I have an issue sometimes with the idea that uh, L1 is the only thing you go for cost. The reason why some of our you know, roads and flyovers and stuff is are not up to world-class standards is um, quality specs are sacrificed for price. Um, but I, I don't think there's anything uh, around FDI, which, which is what we're going to be focused on uh, in the construction industry that I'm aware of. Uh, but I do think, compared to international standards, health and safety is, is shocking. Uh, the number of people who unfortunately get injured or, or worse uh, is not acceptable. Um, I have a thing I want to move on to, Jodi, if I may, when you're Absolutely. ready for me. Um, just go back to FDI. 
I I think one of the I totally agree with what's been said about everything is known. The government is trying to do the right thing, and all this is absolutely right, of course. But if you take press note three, which is the latest thinking from the government on FDI policy, to my mind, it's an extremely retrograde step. It seems to be rushed out in a hurry, ill thought through, and essentially, as you, all of you know, probably it means that no neighbouring country, a company from a neighbouring country or investor from a neighbouring country can invest in India without prior permission. Now, obviously, that's a reaction partly to COVID and the concern that Indian assets are undervalued and also that there's an element of of concern about Chinese competitiveness vis-à-vis India. But if you think about the policy objective of it, um, if you want to control takeovers of Indian business or if you want to control national security issues, you would do it in a different way rather than a blanket ban on a private equity fund from Hong Kong investing a minority strike in a digital company in India. Or in my own case, my, myself doing an investment living in Hong Kong into India, into a, a business which I assume is welcome in, in India. So I think that policy is not all fixed. And sometimes uh, there are uh, nationalistic protectionist urges which produce spurts of government activity in every country, including India, in a democracy, uh, which are extremely um, ill thought through. So my suggestion to Hindle is get rid of Press Note 3. If you want to have a national security policy, a CFIUS equivalent, or a you know, Canada Act, as Moon will know about, then have that, but not Press Note 3. Any response? I have noted it down carefully. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, <Austin. laughs> And uh, since time is almost up, let me just say, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, you know, we, from the Invest India point of view, should I say, at least we can assure you that we are regularly voted as the world's number one and best investment promotion agency. So do reach out to us. We will do everything we can. We really will. I do not mean this merely as, you know, as a statement in this panel. We really go out of our way to help. So if you have any concerns at any point, you know, you know my email address, you know my number, just reach out to us or any of my colleagues at Invest India. Uh, we really try our best and we will continue to strive to try our best to help you. And uh, Moon, Alan made the, the, the reference to Canada. Would you have any comments about that? Uh, about Canada to what context? The Invest Canada Act is whereby, you know, only only sensitive areas does the government prevent investment, like the Canada arm, of course, on the satellite, you know, things like that, Canada, rather than you know, banning, uh, banning all investment. I would say, you know, in Canada, it's really not as such as in India. Um, I think I would like to be sensitive around this topic in a situation that, you know, we can't really compare um, Canada and India because, you know, they have different histories and different economic structure. And um, the competitiveness of different industries are quite different. So I think maybe the comparison is not correct. Canada definitely has the benefit of, you know, NAFTA. And now they're building so many other agreements with Australia, Singapore. So it's a very different um, structure, I would say. Uh, and India has come so far and has done wonderfully well doing their own trade agreement, their own set of system in a very different way, but they have done very well. So I would say the comparison is not very fair, but I would always say that we are um, in 2020, we're at a time that we're all here to learn from each other and just be inspired and see, you know, what really works for us and in our local context and become very competitive from that. I'd like to quickly address one of the sure, questions I can see from the. About a minute, from, so it's very quick. Yeah, I know. I can just see a question coming up on technically skilled resources. I'll just tell you my quick experience. I mean, again, by we we hire every year thousands of diploma trainees and keep them on for a two-year or a three-year program, and we we get the benefit of their of their work of working with us technically skilled, but we train them. And as I said, that you, partnership with several in educational institutions, working with the students and the professors, them working with us, us my, my team going across there is making a difference. That's one way across industry where we could add to technically skilled resources in India if that if partnership uh, takes place. Okay, thank you. Well, I think that's the end of our time. So it's gone very quickly. It only remains for me to thank uh, the panelists for sharing their knowledge and insight today. Uh, thank you also to you, the audience. Uh, do enjoy the rest of the meeting. Goodbye.
Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.